The author Janine Roth recounts a story in one of her books about a meditation retreat she went on. And the leader of that retreat, her teacher, once held up a teacup in front of the room and said, this teacup is already broken. Now, in a perfectly literal world, that teacup was not, at that moment, strictly speaking, broken. Right then, it was a whole teacup with a pretty little floral pattern. But what the teacher was trying to point out was the reality of the long view. And perhaps in this room and in this space, we would call it God's view. In the long story of the universe, there were several billion years before that teacup was made. There's been a tiny, tiny, tiny pocket of time where that particular teacup has existed and it will not last forever. It will be broken at some point and then it will be broken and then gone forever until the end of time. In one sense, that has already happened. The broken teacup is a reality. There's no outcome of the universe where that one teacup remains intact and beautiful. In one sense, this has already happened. On this day, we come to one another in this space. And we are marked with a sign of our own brokenness and the reality of our own eventual death. You come to the rail, and your priest who loves you looks you right in the eye and says, you're going to die. Or, in reality, you're already dead. The teacup is already broken. This building has already been destroyed. This neighborhood is already gone. There is no running from this truth. No one gets out of here alive. Looked at from one angle, this is incredibly grim news. Darkest sermon of the year so far. However, looked at from another angle, this is the best news we could possibly get. Because it gives shape to our lives and to our story. Having a deep understanding that this is all fragile and temporary and fleeting, we are given tremendous freedom to appreciate it thoroughly right now. All of us get this one body we're in, this one shot at this one life. And we're all dealt a hand at the beginning of it. Some of those hands are incredibly difficult. Some are remarkably easy. But we all get a choice about how we play that hand before the reality of death comes. What is it that God wants us to do in this tiny little sliver of time before the eternity of death. What is it that God is calling particular you to do with this little sliver of a gift of a life? For 
myself, there are a few strong hints from the reading today that tend to pop up. The first comes from the Isaiah text. If you'll notice in this reading from the prophet, we're given a series of if-then scenarios. If we break the bonds of injustice, then we will be made strong. If we loosen every yoke, then we will be like a watered garden. If we share our bread, generations after us will be raised up. This is not automatic. It is not just what God will do for us because we're nice people. It is if and when we do the work, the work of God as love, as verb, as an action, public love, then we brighten like a watered garden. There's a second hint in our gospel reading. We're warned today in no uncertain terms about being religious for show. And we live in a culture super saturated with Christians relentlessly performing their Christianity, right? It's all over TV, you know, there are all the Christians really upset about Obama mentioning the Crusades, that you can't talk about a historical event. Christians obsessed with who other people are sleeping with, talking about it on the news all the time. And they're often disguising all this preening as witnessing. And so somehow we land in this culture where everyone is talking about how Christian they are and half our public school students live in poverty. Jesus seems to be telling us today that there is a direct inverse relationship between how loud we are about our faith and how well people actually get taken care of. The more yapping about Jesus, the more people starve. This is not a system, apparently, that Jesus approves of. The third strong hint is a piece that we haven't heard yet in the liturgy, but it's coming. It comes from Psalm 51, and it's about brokenness but about hearts rather than teacups. We will read together that God does not despise a broken and contrite heart, that we sacrifice to God our troubled spirit, not our whole one. And this may be where all of this boils down into our individual person, this core message of Lent. We are charged with changing the public sphere. We are not permitted to let the injustices of this world go by, but we do it by allowing our broken nature to shine through. We have to be willing to be broken by this world to care enough to want to do something about it. We have to allow our own hearts to be shattered by grief and sorrow and to be willing to offer them shame and fear and loss and grief and pettiness and tiredness and disdain as they are to our God. We're not called to be perfect. We're not called to be superheroes. We're called to be people sad enough to do the work of love. Whether that's in the streets or maybe offering ourselves to that one relative or coworker or neighbor that just gets on every last nerve. Lent is for our holy brokenness, for the reality that our bodies, these teacup bodies, are already broken 
and already dead. There's only one way this story ends, and it's a corpse. And it is for our self-offering, our material presence to our own hearts and our own families and to the world. We examine our own souls with penitence and fasting and tremendous honesty. And we allow the hearts around which we have built every defense and protection to be broken by the world, to be troubled for the love of God and this fallen world. We clean house inside so we can clean house outside. We're going to die. The teacup is already broken. Out of the pieces of our broken hearts, let's build something real. <laughs>